Hello everyone, it's my honor to present you the research work uh, that I conducted when I was in the University of Minnesota. The topic I'm going to talk is estimating the impact of automatic vehicles on traffic assignment, mobile speed, and parking destination choice for morning commuter trips. Have you ever had the experience that you spend half an hour to find a parking space in downtown area during the peak hour? Or the experience of you have to park at a high price parking lot as there is no low price spaces around? According to previous slides, drivers spend 8% to 74% of travel time on finding parking spaces in the congested downtown area. Drivers sometimes have to choose a parking space with a higher price to avoid the long walking trip. However, with fully automated vehicles, commuters no longer need to walk back to their destinations after they park their vehicles. Instead, AVs can search and navigate to low price parking spaces or drive to home after dropping the commuter. This figure depicts the travel behavior for morning commuters using AVs and HVs. Commuters depart from home, and we assume that they could choose only AVs or HVs traveling to the workplace. In this figure, they can go by path one or path two. If commuters choose HV, they would like to park around work workplace with high parking fees. For commuters who choose AVs, they can also park their vehicles to suburban area with low parking fee by path 3, or assign their uh, AVs to their residences with zero parking cost. Before AVs reach 100% market share, there will be a transition period where HVs and AVs are two alternative mode choices for people who prefer to own automobiles. Regardless of owning and operating cost, we assume that HVs and AVs are competing for users by out-of-pocket expenses in the morning. We also made uh, some other assumptions. Firstly, we assume that there is no dedicated lane for AVs only. In other words, we assume HVs and AVs are all mixed on their current traffic network. Secondly, we assume that trade uh, the, the off-street uh, parking spaces are aggregated to the closest zones. Thirdly, parking price at the commuter's home is assumed to be zero. Finally, uh, we follow Wardrop's first principle that all trips are selfish and would like to choose the path with the shortest path travel time from mm -hmm. the origin to the destination. Impl implementing aut uh, autonomous vehicles could provide plenty of advantages, however, with AV implemented in the network. Traffic congestion might increase due to induced trips that AV self-navigate to remote parking lots which would be a big challenge for the transportation system. So, this study investigates the potential impact of the different parking behavior induced by AVs. In this study, we defined three equilibriums. The first is the equilibrium in road choice. As we have assumed for a human-occupied AV trip, human-occupied AV trip and self-driving AV trips. The cost of all used paths are equal to the shortest path cost. None of these three types of users can unilaterally change routes to reduce their travel time in the equilibrium condition. This uh, can be written in as equations in equation one, two, three. Second is the uh, equilibrium in mode choice. The total demand for each OD pair is fixed. Both AV demand and HV demands are variable deter variables determined by the mode split process. The parking fee in terms of money is an input and fixed for each zone. For commuters with the same origin destination pair, most speed between 
H race and A race is estimated using the multinomial logic model. Commenters will choose the mode that with the probability that depends on the total travel impedance of each mode. The smallest travel impedance for H race and A race for each OD pair are for each OD for, for each OD pair are determined by equations four and five. Using a, a multinomial logic model, the probability for a commuter to travel in, the, in an AV or HV is calculated as equations 6 and 7, respectively. Because the most fluid results are decided together with the traffic assignment process, the number of commuters who take AVs and HVs to commute is endogenous and depends on travel times. Also, the shortest path travel time from destination to any parking lot is unknown. This, this leads to the difficulty in modeling the AV parking lot choice model. We model self-driving AV trips departing for a remote parking lot using a trip distribution model. If most fleet result is known, the parking location for self-driving AV trips can be decided by this program. In this program, the objective function considers both traffic assignment and parking lot uh, choice. The choice of the optimal parking lot is the result of a trade-off between parking cost and the travel time. Finally, a static uh, traffic assignment model is developed together with the mode choice between AVs and HVs, and the parking lot choice process for AVs. Travel time is assumed as a function of the total flow. The objective consists of five main parts. The first term is the big mass function derived from the user equilibrium. The second and third terms related to the multinomial logic choice model. The fourth term represents the total parking cost generated by HV trips. The fifth term derived from, from the trip distribution process of the of parking lot choice for AVs. All flow should satisfy the conservation law. We have proved the problem equivalency between the optimal solution of this model and the three equilibriums described above. Correspondingly, an iterative algorithm to solve the mathematics program is derived. To solve the model we proposed, the Sufos network is tested. Zones marked in red are assumed to be, to be CVE area, and other zones are in rural area. The default Sufos network is used as the benchmark scenario to test the effect of different parking phase in CBD and rural zones. We designed four scenarios. In the rural zone, the parking fees are set to 0, 0 0.5, 1, and $1.5 dollar per hour for scenarios 1 to 4. For all those four scenarios, the parking fee is set to $2 per hour in the CBD area. We also assume that the morning trips would park for four hours. As we can see from, say from this table, as the parking costs increase in the rural area, the average travel time per trip and the percentage of trips that park at their origin increase. The average travel time per trip increases from 21 per, uh, minutes, minutes to approximately 30 minutes for this four scenario. This figure shows that uh, the change in the number of vehicles parked at each zone. Points on the horizontal plane reflect zones in Silver's network. Labels R and C at every zones represent if this zone is in rural or CBD area. The value on Z axis indicates the difference in the number of vehicles parked in the comparison scenario and the benchmark scenario. The red pillar represents that there are less vehicles parked in the zone. Green pillar means more vehicles parked in the zone. Scenario 1 represents an extreme case where the rural zones have zero dollar parking cost. Commuters take AVs would easily find a nearby uh, rural zone to park their vehicles. With the increasing parking cost in the rural zone, 
the attraction is decreasing de decreasing for AVs park parking in the rural zones with the in induced trips. Meanwhile, knowing from the previous table, the percentage that AV trips parked at their origin is also increasing. It is because the compensation from lower parking fee in the rural zone could not offset the travel cost to that zone gradually, and it is cheaper to take a longer trip to their origins and park with zero cost. The, prefer the preference between AVs and HVs is not only scenario dependent, but also destination dependent. As shown in this figure, for commuters with destination in the CBD area, 64% commuters choose AVs in scenario 1. It results from $0 parking cost in rural zones, which encourages commuters to send their AVs to a nearby rural zone. The increased parking fees in the rural zones weaken such preference, as shown in scenario 2 to scenario 4. For commuters with destination in the rural zone, although AV, uh, AV commuters are increasing as the parking fees in the rural zones continuously improve, it has a lower growth rate compared with com uh, commuters having destination in the CBD area. It is because AV users with destination in the CBD area are more sensitive to the parking fees given parking alternatives. To conclude, this study firstly considers the equilibrium in road choice, mode choice, and parking lot choice in one mathematical program for the new parking behavior due to the implementation of AVs. The iterative solution algorithm is proposed for the mathematical program. Four scenarios are designed for different parking price schemes in CBD and the rural zone. Although the average travel time per trip increases significantly with AVs implemented, the parking space are also saved as people are willing to park their AVs at, at a region. Okay, that's all I have to present today. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Oh, thank you for helping me uh, present the recording. Uh, any questions? I have them, but I think there's two in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, which software did I use? Oh, the Python. Uh, let me let me double check. Uh, slide fourteen. Oh. Uh, what's the, do you mean how I uh, graph this figure? Uh, Adika, right? Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce your name, uh, but if you ask, if you are asking uh, how I uh, figure it, it is uh, a region. And if you are asking what kind of so software I use to run the model, it's Python. Yeah. And uh, fitted map. Uh, what difference between HVs and AVs did you consider in your uh, difference? Oh, so HVs, so um, in this study, I only uh, modeling the difference between HVs and AVs on the parking behavior, the main difference. So AV, AVs can uh, drive to anywhere to park to find a low price parking, but HVs, because uh, you need to park around your destination. So HVs is limited, has limited uh, opportunity to park around uh, the destination. Yeah, that's a main difference. Uh, individual for analysis, not the whole corridor traffic. Uh, yes, I only consider the uh, individual AV, yeah, instead of shared autonomous vehicle, yeah because uh, this is the first study consider considering all three mo uh, three equilibriums. Yeah. I, I, noticed, uh -huh. I noticed that, um, I could be wrong, but correct me if I'm wrong, that you assume that the vehicle itself has a value of time. That is that the, the vehicle that's moving empty from the um, yeah. drop-off location to the parking lot 
yeah. uh, incurs a cost that's based on time as opposed to based on distance. C can you explain why you made that assumption? Yeah. So uh, let me share the screen very first, uh, very quick. Let me find the. Oh, the host disabled participant. Uh, it's okay. I can uh, explain briefly. So uh, when I built the assignment model, uh, because all the units should be converted to uh, one unit, uh, we have two options, tra transfer, uh, sorry, convert uh, travel time into money or convert money into travel time because we have both parking cost and the travel time to impedance for uh, each trip, right? So uh, that's why we have to convert it to co uh, compute, communicate for each trip how much you need to pay uh, for both mm -hmm. travel time and uh, parking cost. Yeah. Can you convert distance to dollars and work in dollars? Yeah. Uh, I searched uh, through literature and find uh, average, uh, uh, on average how much uh, it cost per hour in US, yeah. Oh, uh, did I answer your question, Michael? Yeah, thank oh. you, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, why do more travelers, wings? why do more travelers prefer AV when the cost saving of the remote remote parking? Uh, let me, let me, let me think why when the cost saving of, oh, um, because um, the AV can park into the uh, or suburban area, right? Because suburban uh, area, the uh, parking cost is very low, and it uh, between the trade off uh, for the trade off between uh, travel travel time and the parking cost the. A parking cost to win because it costs no money. So uh, AVs prefer to drive longer, for, for example, to a very, very long area, uh, one hour around, uh, away from your destination. So in scenario four, people prefer to choose the AV. Uh, thanks. Thank you for your question. Uh, is that clear? Um, I think uh, that's all the questions. Thank you all for listening. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Fatem Fakhar Musami. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Texas at Austin, working with Dr. Kara Kockelman. Uh, I'm joining uh, University of Connecticut in a few weeks as an assistant professor in uh, transportation engineering. Uh, in this presentation, I will be talking about uh, implementation of uh, parking strategies uh, for shared autonomous vehicles uh, to on street and off street parking lots and investigating the impacts of different parking search strategies on SAB fleet operations and uh, parking costs. The demand uh, for shared autonomous vehicles uh, are expected to overtake uh, the demand of transportation network companies such as Uber uh, and Lyft. These vehicles uh, will offer ride hailing and pooling option. In addition, uh, these vehicles will add empty vehicle miles travel because of being empty in their pickup trips, recharging uh, and maintenance uh, trips. In addition, curb congestion will be uh, an important issue uh, having these vehicles on the street because of uh, their idling on uh, curb sites. Most uh, shared autonomous vehicle studies assume that uh, SAVs idle in place between rider requests, which add to the curb congestion. A few studies assume that these vehicles disappear from the network uh, or cruise empty around the network, which are not realistic uh, assumptions. Um, in reality, cities uh, will limit idling along um, curb sites to control the curb congestion. So, in this paper, we ensured that SAVs park at permitted on a street and off a street uh, parking spots using a trade off between cost, um, parking costs, and cost of going to the parking location and uh, distance. In terms of the uh, data sets, uh, we use um, the city of Austin's GIS database uh, to 
uh, compile on street parking locations. We also uh, use Google Street View and on site observations to fill in the gaps uh, in the parking locations of the CPD. Uh, we also um, combine. Um, Combined uh, office street parking lots using the data of Texas Facilities Commission and the Downtown Austin Alliance. Now uh, we didn't have the uh, on street parking spots uh, and across the entire uh, Austin metro area, so we assumed that uh, we have one uh, parking space each uh, ten meters um, across the network. Um, and in each direction, on each direction, we also use the open street map uh, to have a, a rough estimate of the parking uh, uh, spaces, parking locations across the uh, Austin uh, area. Here you can see the uh, network that uh, we used uh, for in this study, the Austin Six County metropolitan area. You can see that we have on the street free parking uh, spots in blue. Uh, on a street paid parking in um, green and on off street garages in red here in the CBD area and across the entire six county met uh, metro area we have only uh, on a street free parking locations these Free parking locations are aggregated um, parking uh, spaces. So we aggregated different spaces into one parking spot uh, on that zone. So um, in total, we had approximately 8,400 uh, parking groups or lots uh, across the uh, entire Austin Six County metro uh, area. Here you can see the uh, distribution of parking lot groups um, on different zones across the network. You can see that we have uh, a lot more uh, parking lots, parking groups um, in the CBD now, which has uh, a higher population density. Uh, in terms of the public space, uh, you can see that in these on these zones, which has um, uh, which have. Uh, uh, a larger area, uh, we have more spaces. So as we aggregated them to uh, a few parking spots, uh, we have um, you know um, we have a low number of parking lots on those um, area. Uh, on average, uh, the addresses um, are located um, uh, are, are located in uh, 0.3 miles of the cl their closest parking lot location uh, with a median of 0.2 miles. Yeah, and uh, in the most um, yeah, dense area of the network, meaning the uh, CBD area, we had about 5.4 uh, parking lots uh, per acre. Uh, we implemented the parking search model uh, for shared autonomous vehicles in uh, Polaris Traffic Simulator, which is an agent-based traffic simulation tool uh, by Argonne National Lab. Uh, Polaris uh, sends, uh, in this um, parking search model, we send the vehicles uh, to the uh, closest parking or the parking with the least uh, cost considering the price of the parking and uh, the price of going to the parking location. Now, once uh, a parking uh, spot is assigned to a vehicle, let's say we follow the best route uh, to the site, uh, we also assume that uh, the cost per mile of SAV and SAVs are um, similar to the traveler's uh, cost um, when they are using an SAV. Uh, so uh, we use $1 per SAV mile for both cases. We also considered assumed a maximum distance that we can send a, uh, an SAV uh, to a parking. Uh, we assumed at the value of 10 kilometers or six miles, or um, but uh, it can be reduced or increased. Uh, here you can see uh, the algorithm that we use for parking search uh, model. Uh, once um, an SAV is idle, we check if uh, it has a parking uh, assigned. If it doesn't, uh, depending on the parking search strategy that we chose already, now we find uh, the least um, cost parking or the closest parking. We assign the parking, send the uh, SAV to the, uh, to the assigned parking, and uh, once it is in the parking location, we update the capacity of the parking and the parking database, including time in, time out, and fees, uh, and so on and so forth. Here you can see the uh, study area uh, for simulation scenarios of this study, uh, which is the Austin Six County network. Um, in uh, the simulation scenarios of this study, we assumed that vehicles will start or end trips uh, in the uh, Travis County, only in the Travis County, which is in red here. Uh, however, other vehicles can start or end trips anywhere in the network to keep the congestion of the uh, trips uh, going uh, vehicles going in, uh, out of the uh, this uh, geofence. Uh, 
Uh, we also simulated traffic for 75% uh, of Austin population. Um, in addition, we assume that SAV fares are uh, $1 per mile plus a $1 pickup um, fee. Um, finally, we assume that everybody is traveling solo. So uh, party size is zero in the scenarios of this study, but uh, strangers can share rights in um, SAVs. Uh, Here you can see the uh, results for different SAV fleet scenarios uh, with restricted and unrestricted SAV parking. Uh, with unrestricted SAV parking, we mean that we address an idle uh, in place. Uh, so we, uh, here we can see that uh, we have um, a slightly lower profit per day per SAV when we use the parking strategies and a little bit higher wait time for users, which is expected because now we relocate SAVs across the network to send them to the parking uh, locations. Uh, in addition, we had um, a little bit lower average vehicle occupancy by parking strategies, lower idle time for these vehicles, and a much lower uh, empty vehicle miles uh, traveled uh, in terms of the comparison between uh, different uh, SAV fleet sizes. You can see that we have a much lower profit per SAV per day and much lower wait time for users uh, once we increase SAV fleet size uh, to serve 75% population of Austin. Um, in addition, we have um, a much lower average vehicle occupancy and double idle time. And so we should find a balance between the SAV fleet size, between the wait time uh, that uh, we want, we expect and profit and APOs that uh, we expect for each uh, network. Here you can see the comparison of results for different parking search strategies. Um, you can see that um, we have uh, the parking fee of um, um, lower than a three and a half dollars per SAV per day if we send vehicles to the closest parking location. Um, uh, in addition, we have um, the parking fee of lower than $23 per SAV per day if we use the least cost parking search strategy. All these values are negligible because we have a lot of free parking locations, free parking spots across the Austin area. Uh, if we compare the parking search strategies uh, with uh, unrestricted SAV parking, we can see that uh, the parking fee for other vehicles is slightly increased if we use parking search strategies, about uh, 10%. Uh, which is um, because uh, these vehicles, because some free parking locations will be occupied by uh, shared autonomous uh, vehicles. Here you can see the, um, the spatial distribution of SAV trip requests and the SAV parking spots assigned across the network. You can see that all trip requests are inside the Travis County area. Um, in addition, all parking uh, demand are inside the Travis County area and we have a higher parking demand on places on zones where we have a higher uh, trip request. Uh, in addition, uh, we know that SAVs will lower overall demand for parking garages relative to the transportation network companies because of sharing uh, rights and uh, being less idle. Here you can see uh, the temporal distribution of uh, parking, uh, public parking uh, spots aside, uh, and the SAV uh, request um, over the simulation time, which is 24 hours. Uh, you can see that we have a peak uh, SAV request at around 7.30 to 7.45 a.m. Uh, and uh, in the afternoon between 5 to 5.15 p.m. Uh, we have also highest uh, SAV parking demand around noon and um, at 7.30 to 7.45 p.m., which, is, um, which, is, which has a lag uh, relative to the SAV request, which is expected. Overall, we observed that parking costs uh, average less than uh, $4 per day per SAV in the um, closest parking strategy and less than $3 in the minimum parking search strategy. Uh, having the restricted SAV parking, uh, we have um, about one to uh, one and a half minutes more wait time for users and lower 
profit about $10 per SAV per day. However, we should consider these SAV parking uh, strategies uh, to control the curb uh, congestion. Uh, in addition, requiring a savings park uh, off the street raised uh, parking costs for other vehicles by about 10%. Um, however, these magnitude, magnitudes are uh, still small thanks to the, a lot of parkings available in the Austin area. Uh, finally, uh, SAVs um, may uh, buy spaces in the CBD and uh, places that had um, places that have high demand across the network. Uh, so, future work should consider uh, this sort of pre-staging uh, behavior. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time. Um, this uh, the draft of this uh, work is available on Dr. Cockleman's uh, website. You can refer to that, and uh, uh, I will be happy to answer to your uh, questions. Yes, yes. Uh, is there any way that I can share my screen? Um, start video as well. You oh wait my bad. All right, now should be sharing my screen and okay. Alrighty, uh, thanks everyone for inviting me. I'm really uh, flattered to be here, and um, today I'm presenting the move that away. Okay, um, strategic and tactical decision-making for uh, platooning on multi-lane highways. So uh, the presentation will go in the following orders. I will be starting by introducing some background knowledge and then the algorithm framework. And then after that, I can go through uh, some organized behavior that's basically the detail of our algorithm and how we establish a platooning algorithm and then introduce our intelligent cooperative planner, which is another part of our um, behavioral planning algorithm. And then lastly, we can present some results and some videos. Uh, okay, let's get started. So before I go into details of the algorithm, here is some uh, background knowledge. So uh, the platooning is actually referring to the technology we uh, established between a string of CAV vehicles that um, communicate which, which with each other. Uh, the platooning is actually based on uh, the previous study, which is called CACC. Um, CACC is then based on ACC, which is already uh, available in most of the vehicles nowadays. Um, basically, the main idea here is to um, establish vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, which allows each following vehicle to have the information of its preceding vehicle. So uh, in the chart below, you can see that uh, the vehicle number two it's receiving information from vehicle number one, um, understanding its target speed. So vehicle number two can have better um, control and understanding to better optimize uh, the distance in between the first and second vehicle. So this manner goes, this is the basic principle of uh, CACC, so cooperative, cooperative adaptive cruise control. And, um, uh, this method goes recursively backward um, to the end of the string, forming forming a single lane CAV vehicle that's closely uh, travel next to each other. And this technology can significantly reduce congestion and increase lane capacity based on previous researches. Uh, here is a chart that the previous study refer uh, previous studies result. So with increasing market penetration, so with increasing percentage of CAV in the traffic stream, uh, the capacity increases. 
So how, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, our platooning work is based on CACC. Uh, the main drawback of the CACC, if we go back a little bit, is that it's a single string in a single lane. However, the platooning algorithm we presented have multi-lane capability um, in which we establish a control hierarchy where we have leader and followers. Um, for traditional CACC, there is no leader follower. It's just a recursive algorithm that runs uh, uniformly on each vehicle. But for our platooning, the leader has more control of the member of the platoon. And then by this um, leadership, this membership um, hierarchy, the leader can help each member do multi-lane, more complex maneuvers such as multi-lane drawing and on-ramp merge. Uh, those are three typical scenarios that we can introduce later, but the main idea is the difference between platooning and CCC. Then the first part is our uh, framework. Um, before we go into detail of the algorithm framework, uh, we would like to mention that um, traditionally, well, modern ADS or modern uh, autonomous vehicle platform basically have uh, three, three modules, which is sensing, computing, or actuation. So basically, these are three big steps for autonomous, for fully autonomy. The first one is to uh, sensing, which is also perception. This is the module help vehicle understand where it is and where is the start of the route and where should the vehicle go. And then um, we have a computing or planning module, which uh, based on the current vehicle station, uh, current vehicle position and target position, uh, generate a detailed driving plan. And then this driving plan will go to the actuation module uh, to which will basically uh, handle the vehicle, the throttle, the steering, everything. So based on this three-step architecture, um, our algorithm fits in the planning, planning stack or computing stack and within the planning module. So planning module here is the planning, the number two step in the previous charts. So platooning algorithm or application would be one of the planning modules. And in here we have two steps, uh, mission planning and motion planning. So in a, on a higher level, the mission planning generates a semantic plan, which um, basically, tell, basically tells the vehicle uh, a high level maneuver, such as uh, stick within the lane or do the lane change or, you know, or just overtake the front vehicle. So that's, uh, or just uh, going on ramp and drawing the target platoon. So this is a high level mission. Uh, once this mission is uh, generated based on our uh, finite state machine or learning based controller, this plan will then go to the motion planning where we generate trajectory, a detailed trajectory, which consists of each uh, waypoint and the speed at the each at the corresponding waypoint. So, so this is the detailed trajectory motion plan. So after the motion plan, the trajectory will be sent to the lower level controller and then establish um, autonomous control. And then, so, well, our platooning algorithm mainly have two, um, so the motion planning is, is just gap regulation or controlling the gap and uh, realize the, uh, just to apply the previous mission plan. And in terms of mission planning, we'll have two uh, parallel algorithm. One of them is rule-based planning. This is just a uh, simple rules that we wrote. Um, so basically that, that different sets of roles, they pre depress the current um, traffic situation and uh, find a proper strategy for the current situation. That, that is most suitable for uh, easier freeway applications. 
um, this is the baseline algorithm and because it's finite state um, it's pre-written so the computational cost is really slow um, th so this handles the most general applications however when there's a really complex situation such as um, on-ramp merge especially we're trying to establish cooperation between the merging vehicle and the mainline vehicle um, such this this complex scenario is really hard um, to be summarized in in finite states so we trained a learning based planning controller uh, in parallel with the rule based planning the uh, in parallel with the finite state machine to handle this uh, complex situation so this is running as a supplement algorithm and it's only um, suitable for certain certain scenarios uh, in particular on ramp merge and then after the overview well here is just a um, finite state machine a snapshot of what finite state machine is so um as we mentioned earlier we have leaders and followers uh, so for vehicles and leaders it will refer to the flow chart on the top um in normal operation condition it would just be in the leader state leading the platoon and then um, if there's another candidate leader, so another candidate leader trying to join to the platoon in the front, this leader will give up the leadership. And then um, if the incoming vehicle is trying to join from the back, um, it will become, uh, become a candidate follower and then goes back to follower state. And for, well, I think this is kind of abstract. Well, yeah, here we go. Um, so let's just wrap this up. This is just an abstract of what finite state machine is. We have super state and a smaller state, which basically regulates what's going on uh, during the uh, during the freeway conditions. And then I think this is a more um, detailed scenario that is easier to uh, go through to help you guys understand the finite state machine and scenario that we studied. So this is a cut and join operation. Um, so the yellow vehicle is the, is the joining vehicle and is communicating with the leader to sending request, basically telling the leader his intention to join the platoon. And uh, because it's a single CADS, its default state is the leader. And a platooning member is not doing anything, just following the leader and maintaining the platoon gap. And the leader will uh, receive the yellow car's request and judge if it's, uh, if it's okay for him to join the platoon. <clears throat> and then this is the second step. If the leader determines we have space within the platoon and based on your position, uh, so if, if your initial position is is uh, really close to the second vehicle, I will tell the second vehicle to slow down and then create a gap for you and then notify you it's time to make the lane change to join the gap and be the new second second vehicle. So this is the cut in, uh, cut in join. In this case, the leader will send two requests, one to the relevant member to slow down, one to the joining vehicle to make the lane change. Then once the lane change is finished, um, the joining vehicle will send another uh, request to the leader telling the leader, hey, I'm, I finished the lane change, now you can add me to the platoon. And then we just, um, once you add me, we are a now longer platoon, just um, keep doing what we're doing following each other in the same lane. And um, so that concludes the basic principles. So that's the basic general case for freeway applications. So here is a genetic fuzzy system, the intelligent controller we use to, um, to handle the on-ramp merging cooperation. So this is much more complex. Um, it's really, hard for us to write this situation is uh, in finite state machines so instead um you know we kind 
um, the joining vehicle kind of just sending its information, reading its relative position information based on the current traffic snapshot, and then calculate a uh, optimized cut and join index. So at this time, the genetic fuzzy algorithm steps in instead of the leader based on the rules to determine the index, cutting index, um, the genetic fuzzy system will calculate a optimal joint index and send this index to the leader. And then leader receive this index and uh, slow down the relevant vehicle and help the incoming vehicle to merge. So that two application concludes the uh, mission planning. And this is the motion planning, which is the second step of our algorithm. Um, this is really the gap regulation where um, within the platoon, each... <laughs> uh, excuse me. So within the platoon, um, each follower is not only receiving its front preceding vehicles information, but also receiving and communicating with the leader. So comparing to CACC, each member is not only aware of its front vehicle, but also the entire platoon uh, to establish better uh, gap or headway regulations. Then uh, here is a brief introduction of our experimental environment. Um, we establish a uh, co-simulation um, in both Carla and Sumo um, because our application really um, across two levels where we need to verify the you know a network level performance of the algorithm, but also it's our our algorithm really controls individual vehicle in great details. Um, so for uh, for Carla we use. We use Carla to simulate uh, ADS vehicles because ADS vehicle will run our algorithm. But at the same time, we use Sumo to control uh, the background traffic with a calibrated, calibrated uh, IDM intelligent driver model to better, to first um, better uh, simulate human behavior and also it's much computational, computational efficiency. Uh, for us to use Sumo to control the background vehicle. Here's the experimental result. Basically, um, it's basically saying um, the algorithm is able to, this is an NGSIM trajectory, just for the information, this is a, the leader's trajectory is a real world trajectory um, uh, that we extracted from video, video data. And then um, the platoon algorithm follows the leading vehicle and trying to soften the disturbance caused by the human behavior. And so basic, based on the acceleration, we can see that uh, the platoon is much more smoother compared to the human driven vehicle. And we're able to maintain a, a relatively steady time gap within the platoon. Okay, and I think this is a video of a uh, Carla simulation where if you see the joining vehicle joins the platoon and uh, the green vehicle are the human driven vehicles. Here is another video. This is the co-simulation where the background vehicle is controlled by uh, Sumo. And then um, the relevant CADS vehicle are controlled by our algorithm. I see once joined, um, each member are able to close the gap as designed. Uh, so yeah, I think that concludes um, the presentation. Uh, I'm ready for questions, if we have any. I can stop share now. Thank you, Zhu, for your um, presentation. I don't know if your first name is Zhu or Han. Uh, it's Zhu. Uh, Zhu, okay. Yeah, thank uh, you. It was a great presentation, and you're doing great work uh, in micro simulation of autonomous vehicles. I'm uh, pretty much impressed. Um, is there any question for uh, Zhu? 
I think there isn't. Okay. So we, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, well, thank, so you. The thank you. Thank uh, you. The next presenter, I think, is from the, the same group uh, from UCLA, and Roshan Shu. Uh, Roshan, can you uh, share your screen, please? Then. Hi. So can everybody see my screen? We can see your screens. Can you see the slides? Right now, yes, we can see the slides. Okay. Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ren Sheng. I'm currently a PhD student in UCLA Mobility Lab working on uh, qualitative driven automation and perception in autonomous driving. Uh, so here today I want to present the work OpenCDA, an open cooperative driving automation framework integrated with co simulation. Um, this work is actually very related uh -huh. to. Sorry. So, this, this work is actually really related to the, uh, the work that she just presented and it, as it pr uh, provides a simulation environment framework for, for his algorithm. Um, able to, a participant required a link. Okay. Um, so, let's get started. So although recent uh, advancement in deep learning has brought the autonomous driving field into a new area and into a new stage, the challenges still remain. Uh, for example, the perception system in autonomous driving usually suffers from the occlusion and far distance objects, uh, like the figure in the left show, uh, while vehicle is driving along the street, uh, he's driving fast, but at the same time, there's a boy uh, trying to come come across the street. So the white vehicle need to uh, stop immediately to avoid any car accidents. However, because of this red, uh, the green parking car, it totally blocks the view of the white vehicle. So there's no way for deep, deep learning algorithm to detect this boy, as there's no sense of measurement on it. So this case will be very dangerous. And it's also well known that the uh, perception system is uh, very sensitive to the worst weather. Uh, when, when the weather is bad, the, sen the sensor noise is really, really large, and deep learning algorithm cannot handle it very well. Furthermore, uh, recent research has shown that deep learning algorithm is very easy to be attacked. With only some you know, unnoticeable noise or information, they can detect the objects that doesn't exist or ignore the objects that they, they, should, they should detect, which will be very dangerous. And in, term of, in terms of localization, we know that autonomous driving vehicle is highly dependent on the high precision of the GPS. But when the vehicle is driving around a, a street that has high buildings, the GPS error is really large. And such error cannot be solved by algorithm very well. And this will cause uh, troubles for the downstream task like decision planning. And in terms of the planning, um, autonomous driving vehicles are, are currently actually very selfish um, because they, they plan their tra trajectory based on their own goal. And most of them don't, don't care of the whole system, whole traffic system efficiency. So one day when the autonomous driving vehicles are deployed at large scale, the traffic efficiency may not increase to the level we expect. So as we can see, all of these bottlenecks are the challenges that prevent a large scale deployment of autonomous vehicles and deep learning algorithm can also solve this problem. But luckily, uh, we had a new solution that can reliably solve it. That is the cooperative driving automation, uh, short for CDA. Uh, according to SAE, it refers to the automation uh, that uses machine M2M -M communication to enable cooperation among two or more entities with capable communication technology. So it is the intersection of cooperative AI, wireless communication, and autonomous driving. Uh, in short, it turns each AWA becomes a connected autonomous vehicle, which is CAWA. Um, the CDA can be beneficial for many areas of autonomous driving. For example, uh, perception. We, we have seen this scenario in just the previous slide, but this time the situation is very different. Although the, the, the left white car cannot see the boy, the, the car on the outside can see it very clearly. And after he sees the, the boy, it can send the information through communication channel to the, the left car. And now the left car knows that there's a, a boy just behind the green car and should stop immediately to make a safe driving. 
uh, in terms of localization, um, the, for example, in this scenario, all the vehicles are series and they are driving uh, in straight with a uh, heavy audience. The, the, the blue vehicle has its own position uh, information from GPS, and it can also detect the, the red vehicle uh, from perception system. So it get a relative position to the, the, the red vehicle. Um, and you know, combined with its own GPS position, it can get the red vehicle's position from its perspective and see the information to the red vehicle. Although the red vehicle's GPS is not accurate, but now it gets multiple information from its own and from the blue vehicle. And combining all of these information together, it can uh, decrease the GPS error a, a lot. And when several ACVs meet together in the uh, street, they can form a platoon. And in platoon, each member needs to keep a fixed time gap between each other. So they, they need to plan the speed uh, in a, in a organized way and they need to make their speed in a very constant way. So that will increase the traffic efficiency a lot. We can see CDA is really beneficial. However, it's not very easy to deploy. It has a lot of challenges. First, it is very expensive. You have more cars, you will, it will be more expensive. And it, it can raise potential safety issues when you do fail experiment as multiple vehicles are involved now. So a straight solution a straightforward solution to this is to develop a simulation framework so that can uh, do prototyping before you really do file experiment. However, there is no existing simulation framework that directly supports both full stack autonomous driving software prototyping, like perception, localization, planning control, and cooperative driving automation together. So as a result, there's no easy way to validate and compile different CD algorithms. To this end, uh, we present OpenCDA, an open source cooperative driving automation simulation framework. So it can support both full stack autonomous driving development and also the uh, quality driving automation functions. As we can see from the figure, you can see the sensing layer, planning layer, um, the control layer, and also application layer for V2X or communication unit. So it's a X in one framework, it includes autonomous driving simulation, cooperative AI, deep learning, and reinforcement learning together. Um, in summary, it has four major components. The first is the simulation tools. Second is a uh, cooperative driving system, and then a scenario manager and a CDA data manager and report. Uh, so I will introduce one by one. So uh, we know that different simulation, simulation has different advantages. So in the simulation tools, we try to combine different simulator to take the advantage of each other. Uh, we use color to prevent, to, to provide the realistic environment rendering and vehicle dynamics. We use Sumo to provide the realistic background traffic. And we use DI engine to provide reinforcement learning environment. Of course, um, you can integrate any other simulator like NS2 for more, sim uh, more realistic uh, community communication simulation. And all of these simulator together will provide sensor data streaming and IO environment to the driving system. And the driving system will do actions about uh, from, from the given input and return back the control comments to the simulation tools. And then the simulators will do an update. So the core part of the whole framework is our cooperative driving system. Uh, we use a purely Python to code a uh, a driving system that supports both uh, single vehicles, uh, software, software development, like sensing, planning, education. And it also supports the V2X functions like uh, V2X perception, quality localization, plan tuning. Um, so for each module, we have already coded some default algorithm. For example, for the detection, we use Zulu V5 with a simple LiDAR fusion to detect 3D objects. We use GPS and MU sensor together, uh, combined with common filter to get a, a more precise GPS um, localization. And we use some traditional physical models to do the prediction. And we use robust um, system to do the decision and use a cubic blind interpolation plus the kinematic uh, model to do the trajectory planning. And for the control, uh, we use PID controller. 
And we utilize a very light way to simulate the request communication between each um, driving system. It can support communication delay, uh, noise, or package drop. And we also implement some, some um, default uh, algorithm for the V2X function, like late fusion for V2X perception of finite, uh, finite state machine for plantoning. Um, so although all of these modules have default algorithm, the users can replace any of them with their own customized design. For example, they can replace detection with Pompela detection without influencing any other um, algorithms. And uh, in, in OpenCDA, each CAV has its own routing driving system it, and, and it has on his own driving task. And this driving task is assigned by the scenario manager. Um, basically, it has three functions. First, it will define the traffic scenarios, including test location, um, traffic scenario, or traffic density, weather, and so on. Uh, it can be defined either by rule-based file, like YAML file, or driven by deep learning models. Second, it will assign different driving tasks to different CAV, like where you should start, where you should end, or what kind of cooperation you need to seek um, during the whole driving process. And finally, when the simulation is, is done, it will evaluate the whole system performance uh, from both traffic level evaluation or uh, individual level ev evaluation. And the last but not least is the um, uh, CDA, CDA database and uh, manager. So it has two, uh, two missions. First, it can do data log, log, uh, data log replay for testing. Uh, this kind of data can be the real world data, um, like Wemo on using data. Uh, it will provide the API to convert those data format to the format that color can use. And it can also replay a simulation data that collected by OpenCDA itself. Um, the second mission of it is to dump simulated data for offline training, such as V2X perception data and trajectory data for learnable scenario generator. And this, this uh, function is actually very useful. It has uh, three papers out of it. So in summary, um, OpenCD has these five key features. First, it supports both full-stack autonomous driving system prototyping and co-opting driving automation. Second, it supports the connectivity and cooperations between each CAV. Third, it integrates multiple simulation uh, tools together to take advantage of all of them. Fourth, it has highly modularized. Uh, each component has its own default algorithm, but the user can conveniently replace it with their own algorithms. And last, it, has, it provides a lot of benchmark, a benchmark testing map or benchmark testing algorithm and evaluation um, measurements. Uh, more importantly, the whole framework is open sourced. Uh, from, the, from last year, we have already received around 700 stars, 100 folks. Um, welcome to use it. And here's a demo showing OpenCDA's um, whole functions. Uh, we have already seen that from Hugh's presentation, uh, but the, 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 the blue cars are the CAVs, the, the green cars are the human drive vehicles. Uh, they are trying to do a protein watch in this scenario. Uh, from this demo, we can clearly see all the components like detection, localization, planning, and cooperation. And this is uh, not a demo showing that um, our framework can support code simulation. As this one's uh, traffic back, back, tra back, background traffic is controlled by Sumo instead of the colors uh, traffic manager. And as, as I mentioned before, after the simulation run is done, uh, the scenario manager will provide a detailed evaluation diagram for the whole simulation. Uh, here we compile two different planting algorithms and show in this slide. I think that's all from my slide. Um, any question? Thank you, Ren Shang. Um, is there any question for him? No. Um, I have a question. What is the um, largest network size that you can simulate uh, with this um, soft simulation? Sorry. Sorry, I'll say again. Um, I ask, uh, what is the largest network size that you can simulate uh, with this um, simulation tool? Is this a, only a corridor? Or you can simulate a network. 
Um, it can it can uh, support pretty large large scale simulation. Um, but because uh, the, the you know that each module can be turned or turned off if you want to, for example, uh, simulate one hundred plantoni to plantons with large scale background traffic, you may need to turn off some module like detection, um, or localization. Just use the information from so directly. Okay, so does it need you know memory or its computational time is um, high that restricts it for very large scale uh, simulations? Uh, uh, if if you turn off some of the modules I mentioned before, the computation, the memory won't occupy a lot okay. uh, because just some metadata, right? But once you open the like the the detection, you you need to you know load the model uh, from the deep learning uh, algorithm, mm -hmm. so that will be very expensive. Mm -hmm. That's great. And it's an open source tool. Yes. That's correct. Okay. So the code is available to everyone, or the tool that you have a GUI for it? Um, do you, do you uh, I, I don't have a GUI for it, but I do have, we do have a very detailed documentation to show you all the, how to you know, install it mm -hmm. step by step or run a quick demo of how to mm -hmm. do your customization. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, I think um, our next presenter is uh, Yonkon Bok um, from University of California, UMine, I guess. Uh, he will present about uh, the impacts of private autonomous vehicles on near activity location travel patterns. Um, Yonkon, uh, floor is yours. You can share your screen. Thank you. Um... Give me a second. So, so I believe you all can see the screen, right? Okay. Yes, we can see. Okay. Uh, hello, I am Young Hun Bak, a graduate student at uh, University of California, Irvine. My research topic is about the travel patterns of private autonomous vehicles, and this paper particularly covers the private autonomous vehicles parking, searching, travel near activity location. Um, using a mode choice and dynamic parking assignment model, this study um, presents how ABs will impact on the private vehicle's travel pattern. So uh, let me start from the conclusion. Um, first, private vehicles, private AVs, new travel patterns will increase the network BMT. Uh, each each private AV will travel additional one and a half miles for a parking trip. Now, choosing parking space highly depends on the parking fees rather than travel distance. And we can prevent the increase of BMT by adjusting parking costs and capacities. So uh, many studies have suggested that AVs will increase over a BMT. Private AVs travel patterns are also likely to be different from the conventional vehicles. For a private conventional vehicle, I mean the conventional vehicle, a traveler goes to the parking lot near his or her activity location and then walks to the activity location. On the other hand, a private AV user can get up the vehicle at the activity location and the vehicle goes to the parking space by itself. As you can see in the figure at the bottom, there should be additional travel distance due to its deadheading, which is dead traveling without passengers. Since there are no passengers in the vehicles at number three and four trips, which means there are no in-vehicle travel disutility, then the vehicle can move farther to find a better, I mean, cheaper parking space. So we focus on the private AVs near activity location travel, which is the travel between activity locations and parking lots. Then we analyze their impacts on network BMT. So in order to analyze the impact, this study formulates a fixed problem, fixed point problem in terms of mode choice and parking assignment. Basically, travel cost is the result of the um, is a result of the parking assignment with mode choice as input. And the mode choice is the result of mode choice model with travel cost as input. So this back and forth feedback determines the converse probability of private vehicle choice. 
This is how each part works. First, based on the initial private vehicle choice probability and total trip demand, we can simulate parking travel to obtain parking costs. Considering in vehicle travel time, walking time, waiting time, travel distance, we can calculate the expected cost for parking trips. We apply walking time and parking travel time to private conventional vehicles and waiting time for pickup to um, private AVs. According to the expected parking cost, um, travelers choose the most among uh, private vehicle, shared vehicle, and public transit. We use multinomial logic model to calculate the choice probability of each mode. Then we obtain the new choice probability of private AVs, and we go back to the parking assignment model introduced in the last slide. With various scenario settings and given input parameters, the model repeats the iterative solution approach until this choice probability of private AVs is converged, and we analyzed the output with performance metrics. As a case study, we set an imaginary CBD network, as you can see on the right side. The network includes external origins, activity locations, and parking lots. And each intersection reflects intersection delays in order to capture the parking searching travel cost more precisely. Generating vehicles every six seconds, we simulate 4,000 trips for four hours per day, simulating three times per iteration. For the motor parameters, we use a German study survey result. We analyze several scenarios with variations in value of time of AVs, parking fee, and parking lot capacity. Setting base scenario as conventional hand-driven vehicle scenario, scenarios A, B1, and B2 are AV scenarios with different values of in-vehicle travel time. Scenarios C1 and C2 are parking policy implemented scenarios. Both have uniform parking fees rather than varied, and we distributed parking lot capacities evenly in C2. And we also set D1 to D5 with the variation in AV penetration rate. For each scenario, we could obtain a unique solution of private vehicle choice probability. The probability converged at 50% in the base scenario, while the other um, AV scenarios um, converged at 67% to 92%. As a result, we got the most share of private vehicles, shared vehicles, and public transit for each scenario, as you can see on the right side. So even without the parking travel patterns, that will be shown later, um, the mode share of private vehicle is already higher when the private vehicles are automated. And here are the key results of this study. The graph on the right side is the private vehicle's travel distance per vehicle. It shows that um, one private AV can travel extra 1.4 miles for parking search in the default parking space setting um, but when we make the parking fees uniformly and evenly distribute uh, parking capacity, the extra travel declined to 0 0.11 um, mile per vehicle. The second graph reflects the increase of uh, private vehicles demand, which is the result of the mode choice in the last slide. Therefore, um, the overall VMT will increase due to individual vehicles parking travel pattern and due to the mode choice as well. We could also calculate the time and cost matrix. Since all passengers just go to the destination without parking travel, the total in-vehicle travel time, which is person hours travel, PhD, does not increase when the vehicles are automated. However, the parking search process significantly increased um, the VHT, vehicle hours travel. Considering that the mode choice probability dramatically increases in the AB scenarios, the in-vehicle travel time per person decreases as they can avoid parking travel. As a result of the mode choice, the shared AV's choice probability also increases. According to the previous TNCM mobility on demand studies, about 40% of shared, shared vehicles travel distance is dead heading miles. This dead heading is due to relocating travels and pickup travels. Applying this number into our model, 
The shared AVs will also increase VMT as shown in the second graph here. And the third graph is showing the overall VMT increase from private AVs and shared AVs. So this is the convergence of private vehicle choice probabilities with, vari with vari various initial percentage and AV penetration rates. All scenarios converges in 20 iterations and we got the consistent and reasonable choice probabilities. The strength of this study is that it provides transferable and generalizable insights into VMT, parking, and user and system costs. If data including detail, I mean, if data including detailed networks and AB's travel demand model are available, then we can apply this to the real world cities as well. And um, this study shows the new expected near activity location travel patterns for AVs. Uh, which are private AVs search for the cheapest parking lot in the area rather than finding the nearest one, um, which dramatically increased deadheading miles and over VMT in the network. With reflecting road congestion, we believe the model will provide more, more precise results, including mode choice, probability, and travel cost. Thank you for listening. I'd welcome your question. Thank you. Um, is there any question for you, Ankur? That was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you. So I think there isn't any other questions. So um, we will start our next presentation. I am the next present presenter. Uh, I will share my screen. Okay. Um, hi again, everyone. Um, in this uh, presentation, I will be explaining about uh, a part of uh, a project that uh, we're doing for Texas Department of Transportation. Um, in which we are investigating the impacts of self-driving vehicles on Americans' uh, long-distance travel choices. Uh, prior studies predicted that um, some air travelers will shift to autonomous vehicles when these vehicles are available in market. And these, um, and so this shift from air travel to um, AVs, in addition to extending some ground trip distances because of the convenience of these vehicles and increasing trip counts um, because of giving the opportunity of driving to uh, some non-drivers will increase vehicle miles traveled in the network. Um, so uh, in this study, we um, estimated the set of travel demand models prior to AVs and after AVs and applied these models to synthetic population in order to investigate the impacts of uh, these vehicles on uh, Americans' long distance travel uh, choices. So uh, the set of travel demand models start uh, with a trip generation, trip purpose, trip season, and um, tour party size model. Uh, once we estimated these models, uh, we um, estimated more choice and destination choice models, which are coupled with each other. And um, for the, these models, we needed vehicle ownership of each household. So we needed to estimate a vehicle ownership model. And once we had all these models, uh, we uh, applied it to a synthetic population, uh, which uh, was generated using uh, the PopGen software uh, to um, you know, generate disaggregate individual uh, long distance passenger uh, trips. Uh, for this study, we use different data sources. Our main data source uh, was um, a long distance AV travel survey of uh, around 1,000 Americans, which was done as a part of this project. In addition, uh, we used uh, the 2016 and um, 17 uh, National household, household Travel Survey. Uh, which includes um, trips of a sample of Americans, uh, which will scale up to um, 7 billion long distance per person trips um, every year. 
Uh, in addition, we use um, FHW US our journey data uh, to find travel time and cost schemes. Um, this data includes about 1.2 billion long distance tours uh, by US households in 2010, which is a rather old data, but we only used it uh, to extract travel time uh, and cost schemes. Uh, we also use EPS smart location data set uh, for land use information and Dr. Conkleman's vehicle ownership survey, which was done in 2017 uh, for the vehicle ownership model. Uh, we also use uh, public use micro data sample or POMS uh, to uh, generate synthetic population. Uh, in terms of the synthetic population, um, you know, my uh, colleague Yan Tao, who uh, is now working in Aerial uh, National Lab, uh, used PopGen software and 2019 um, five year American uh, Community Survey or ACS uh, to generate 10% uh, of, uh, to synthesize 10% um, of US population. Um, that uh, includes uh, about uh, 28 million individuals um, across 12 million households uh, over uh, the entire U.S. Um, with um, around 73,000 census uh, tracts. Uh, we, uh, for uh, the travel uh, demand models, uh, we estimated um, a Poisson model for vehicle ownership. Um, as you can see here, uh, the uh, vehicle ownership model uh, indicated that a uh, number of drivers in the household and uh, population density of the home location of the households, um, as well as the income uh, of the household, their household size are important contributors to uh, the um, household's vehicle ownership prior to AVs. Uh, for after AVs, uh, we used uh, the study by um, Quartz et al. in 2019 uh, to uh, estimate AVs um, in uh, future years. Um, our uh, travel demand models started with uh, a long distance trip frequency model. The vehicle ownership was an input uh, to these models. So uh, for trip frequency, we use the NHDS data uh, and estimated zero inflated negative binomial model. We use uh, this model because uh, we had a lot of uh, we had have, have a lot of zeros in long distance trips, daily long distance trips. Um, so uh, this model estimates a logit um, you know, has includes a, a logit model that decides. Um, uh, about having the long distance trip and then it has the count model uh, which um, estimates uh, long distance trip frequency. And the um, uh, zero inflated negative binomial model for long distance trip frequency uh, showed that uh, the number of adults in the household, number of vehicles in the household and household income are important contributor. For example, if now we increase how the logarithm of household income uh, with um, not the logarithm of household income with sixty thousand dollars. We will have um, around one uh, fifty percent more um, uh, long distance uh, trips uh, for that person. Um, we applied uh, this tree frequency model to the synthetic population and estimated that um, individuals uh, have uh, two long distance trips per month per capita, which matches the NHDS data information. Um, in addition, uh, we estimated a model um, for, uh, uh, for changing the trip frequency after AVs are available um, and um, applied it to the synthetic population and saw that a long distance trips will raise uh, to 2.05 trips per month per capita after AVs are in market. Uh, we also uh, estimated uh, a trip season model and applied it to the synthetic population. You can see that uh, most trips happen in summer, then fall, winter, and the spring. We assumed that that trip season doesn't change before and after um, AVs. Uh, we also estimated um, trip, um, uh, trip purpose model for long distance trips using multinomial logic model and NHGS data set. Uh, two purposes were business trips, shopping trips, um, other family and business, school, medical, religious, and community trips, visiting uh, relatives and friends, and social recreational trips. 
Um, however, uh, these um, trips were um, uh, only a small portion of long distance trips and most trips were business um, and other working trips, um, in addition to visiting friends and relatives and social and recreational. Uh, you can see here that um, age, um, uh, gender, and uh, having an associated degree education uh, are important factor uh, in trip purpose, in addition to the uh, time, departure time, and uh, household income. Here you can see uh, the, the results of the application of the model to the uh, synthetic population in blue, in addition to the um, uh, NHTS data set, you can see that uh, we have a more, most trips were um, social and recreational, visiting friends and relatives, um, as well as uh, work and uh, commuting uh, trips. Uh, I guess this one was business trips and this, um, this category is other working trips, uh, not only commute ones. Uh, so, um, we also, after um, trip frequency, uh, we estimated a uh, tour party size model using a negative binomial. Um, we use this model to estimate the shifted party size in order uh, to have a zero. Um, the key predictor of predictors of uh, the party size model were um, trip purpose, uh, age, and uh, gender. Um, uh, we observed uh, with the app by the application of this model to uh, the synthetic population that uh, the long distance trip party size was around 2.04 uh, persons. We assume that the uh, party size model doesn't change uh, prior and after, prior to and after AVs. Uh, based on the results of the LDAV survey that we had, uh, we observed that party size doesn't uh, change uh, significantly after the presence of um, AVs. So uh, the most important models in our study were uh, mode choice and destination choice models. However, we needed information from other models as an input uh, to these uh, models. Uh, these two models are coupled with each other because uh, the mode choice log sum is uh, an input of a destination choice model. Uh, for the mode uh, choice models, um, we use the LDAD survey and estimated the joint revolt preference and state of preference logit model um, for business trips and non-business trips. Um, the revolt mode choices uh, were private and auto rent, rental car and airplane and uh, stated preferences were uh, included AV choices, either AVs or um, SAVs. So here uh, you can see the uh, mode choice uh, model um, for uh, the uh, revolt preference and stated preference um, uh, mode choice model. You can see that uh, the utility of air um, increases uh, by having um, a long distance trip over 500 miles. In addition, uh, the utility of autonomous vehicles decreases by having a higher age uh, and um, raises uh, by having at least an associated degree. So it has a relation with um, education. Uh, we applied uh, this model to the synthetic population um, for uh, the year uh, 2040. We assumed that the AV cost is around $3,500. Uh, and uh, we found uh, that um, some uh, trips, and, uh, we have a mood shift from um, air rental cars and conventional cars to AVs, and the AV mode uh, split will be. 27% uh, uh, after the presence of this, uh, these, uh, after having these vehicles in market. Um, uh, in, in terms of the destination choice model, uh, we uh, use uh, the uh, NHTS data set um, as the main data source, uh, in addition to EPS Smart for land use information and our journey data for travel time and scheme information, travel time and cost schemes information. Uh, and uh, we use a multinomial logic model to find uh, the destination choice to around 4,500 NUMA zones across the US. So NUMA zones are um, larger zones than tracks and um, smaller zones than uh, counties. Um, counties. Uh, so we use um, a middle model to estimate different models for business and personal trips. We also use um, a two-step 
strategic sampling uh, by um, Jason Lamp and Dr. Pockelman to reduce uh, the choice set from uh, 4,500 pneumon zones uh, to around 300 uh, choices uh, in order to uh, save uh, memory and computational time. Uh, here is the uh, destination choice model uh, for non-business and business trips. Um, you, you can see that more choice locks on uh, destinations, population density, and employment number of employments in the uh, tract of the destination are important contributors in the destination choice model. Um, and um, medical service, industrial, and retail jobs were important contributors of business trips. Uh, and uh, retail industrial service and public administration jobs uh, were important contributors of non-business uh, trips. So uh, we um, applied uh, this model to uh, the uh, synthetic population uh, and we observed uh, that we have uh, the you know, personalized travels fall slightly uh, from uh, 370 to 349 miles per month per person after these are available. However, uh, this impact uh, does not uh, consider, this, this results does not consider the impact um, of uh, the change in the trip frequency yet, and we should update that uh, the work is in progress. Uh, in addition, uh, we observed that by increasing autonomous uh, vehicles, we will have a higher shift uh, from human-driven vehicles uh, and um, rental cars and air mostly from human-driven vehicles to, um, to um, autonomous vehicles. So overall, we observed uh, that the AV ownership, we estimated the AV ownership uh, to be 0.33. Uh, per American when it costs uh, $350 uh, as the premium cost. Uh, in addition, we observe uh, that uh, we will have a mode shift uh, from 73% private autos, 18% um, rental cars, and 9% airline uh, to 57% um, conventional uh, vehicles, 12% rental conventional rental cars, uh, and 3% Air mode, um, however, we will have uh, 27 to 28 percent AVs um, as the mode share. In addition, we observe that uh, long distance vehicle miles traveled will increase uh, because of um, having a mode shift from air to uh, ground trips. Uh, we have a shift from um, 80 miles per capita per month to 99 miles per capita per month. However, uh, it doesn't. It should be um, even higher than this value because of the changes that we observe uh, in terms of uh, the trip frequency and uh, the uh, change in the uh, distance because of the convenience of uh, trips. In addition, we observe that air miles travel uh, falls. Uh, from 54 uh, miles to 21 miles per capita per month in the same uh, scenario. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this paper is also available in Dr. Cockleman's web website. You can refer to that paper. And uh, is there any question? I'm wondering what you think like the big picture implications are of a pretty significant shift away from air travel towards uh, automated vehicles. Um, so um, we should plan because um, uh, because uh, we have, you know, uh, these most of the shift uh, from air travel to uh, autonomous vehicles happen for shorter distances, for example, shorter than 500 miles, not very long distances to another country or something. So we will have an increased vehicle miles traveled. And so we need to plan for these increased VMTs um, in the networks. And um, um, I, I think and, and these uh, were, um, you know, um, some, these are some of the things that we should plan ahead. Uh, does that answer your question? That's part of it. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like greenhouse gas emissions or some yeah. some other factors. As yes, well. yeah, we should estimate some other factors. We are still working on uh, this project. We are on uh, the late uh, stages, but uh, yes, uh, we are working on those parts. Thanks. Thank you for your question. So.
Um, the questions, I think we had questions in the chat box. What is driving uh, the decrease in PMT after AVs? Uh, Vince, can you, uh, I don't understand, I guess I don't understand the question. What is driving the decrease in PMT after AVs? Um, so, okay. If I understood your your uh, slide, if I was looking at it correct, you were showing that there was actually a decrease in person miles of travel uh, after uh, AVs, and I, I, um, you were showing though earlier that there was an increase, a, a small increase in trip making, um, uh, and so what is what's leading to that decrease in person miles of travel? Yes, uh, you're when, right. When, um... Is it that when people substitute? AVs for air travel, they're uh, making shorter trips in their destination choice, or what, what's going on there? Okay, thank you for a great question. Uh, the thing is that um, it is, you know, uh, we're still updating the results, uh, and uh, I haven't considered uh, the impact of that increase in the trip frequency still in this PMT that you're seeing here. I, I had a note here. Uh, this Decrease in PMT is just because of uh, the mode choice lock sum term uh, in the destination choice. Uh, we had a shift from air travel to, um, to ground travel because of the, um, an additional mode that we had. Uh, so we are observing this decrease because of that. If we add that uh, to, um, increased trip frequency, in addition to the uh, increased distance that we uh, observe because of uh, the convenience, um, convenient driving, uh, we will definitely observe uh, an increase in the person miles traveled. A very great question. Thank you. Thanks. That's that's great. Makes more sense yeah. now. Sorry for the confusion. Yeah, I presented something a sentence earlier and, and haven't used it yet. In, their, in this results that I presented to you. And, uh, what do you mean by long distance travel compared to air travel? Okay, yeah, I, I think Priyanka answered to that question. We assume uh, the distance of over 75 miles um, for long distance trips. However, we have assumptions um, longer than 50 miles or 1,000 miles, well, not 1,000, 100 miles uh, in the literature. What is the effect of disease and crime on this uh, hypo hypothesis? So uh, why um, disease or crime on this hypothesis? Uh, what, I mean, can you uh, clarify what you mean by crime? You mean uh, the sharing um, the rights in an autonomous vehicle or something like this, or disease, you mean something like COVID? Yes. So I was sorry, I've got some background noise here. Um, the, you know, a lot of a, a lot of things have changed since uh, since COVID. Um, there's a lot more, especially in the United States, I would say, you know, a lot of the things that we've talked about in, in vehicles, miles traveled and how people travel. Um, and so I was wanting to know if you had noted any differences and changes since COVID and then since crime has really upticked on, um, you know, in, in, you know, um, in air travel as well as, you know, in um, public transit. Uh, yes, uh, as a part of this study, we observed the impact of COVID. COVID I, uh, I guess uh, we have a paper. I wasn't a co-author in that paper. I will uh, copy it in the chat box. Uh, I don't quite remember the results of that um, study, um, but um, uh, we have observed some, some changes uh, because this study was done between 2019 and 2021, uh, which uh, was uh, the, uh, you know, the time that we had um, COVID and, and decrease in the air travel. Uh, but uh, what we did uh, in this um, paper, in this research specifically, uh, was that we asked questions about uh, a trip before COVID. Um, so uh, we excluded it from these uh, studies. Uh, but I can uh, copy the other study that we, uh, we investigated the impact of COVID in terms of crime. 
we we didn't um, you know we didn't consider uh, this impact. So um, I I don't know what uh, can be the impact of uh, crime on uh, these uh, results. Maybe uh, we have we will have a, a lower uh, um, even more vehicle miles traveled. And that's, that's one of the things that uh, my team is looking at is ro mm -hmm. like we're here in San Francisco and we've seen robo taxi um, pilots like really and the, uh, the licenses and everything just go up dramatically. And that's what our team is studying, like how crime and disease is actually, um, you know, causing um, the robo taxis and everything to like really, ex ex you know, to go from where there wasn't even a driver's license. And now there's a driver's, the, we have a driver's permit for driverless cars, you know, in California. And we're seeing more and more of those pilots just like, you know, go from pilot to now to actually by the end of the year in California, we'll be charging for rides. So like the, so we're, and we're following the more that, you know, there's no mass mandate and crime is exacerbating. So are the, so are the technologies. And then we, we are also monitoring how, um, that how we're looking at there's a lot of questions on VMT and parking and people who with disabilities, Asian hate crimes, um, as well as um, a lot of the, the violence against operators. So operator shortages on transit are causing people to drive more. And then um, rental car prices are another thing where pri rental car prices are have uh, and car buying uh, are two things that are two indicators that we've been watching. And so th that's why I was asking you, that has your thesis changed as these these things have uh, you know have these as these these factors have have come to bear on the situation yeah they will definitely change thank you for mentioning those studies um so i will definitely follow your studies thank you and the next question was hi uh, sorry if i missed this but what was the conclusion about the more choice with and without avs could you go back to that slide and clarify um so in terms of more choice we observed that we have a shift uh, from all three modes to avs uh, but um uh, air travel um almost we had um, one third um, of more choice from nine percent to three percent uh, which was the uh, largest mode shift to autonomous vehicles. Um, so um, we have around 27% autonomous vehicles, including shared autonomous vehicles uh, choices uh, in this study. And uh, the next uh, question uh, was, did you consider the AVs emerge into the market, such as technology costs for travel time saving uh, so in terms of the technology costs, um, yes, we considered different scenarios. I didn't show them here, uh, but um, the technology, uh, we assume that in the scenario that I show here, we assume that we have a um, drop in the technology cost, a drop of 10% per year uh, in technology cost each year. So we will have the technology cost of $3,500 in 2040. Um, but um, other scenarios for technology costing um, considered a five percent drop or um, seven and seven and a half percent drops, uh, in which we had lower uh, uh, adoptions of uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, which will lead uh, to these um, you know these changes in the uh, person wise uh, traveled based on the things that we considered here. Uh, in terms of uh, the travel time saving, um, yes, the model, the more choice model that we can that we estimate that considers the value of time saving of uh, autonomous vehicles based on the choices of users. So we have a lower value of time for um, for uh, autonomous uh, vehicles. Thank you for your question, Anne. and thank you everyone for your uh, great questions. And uh, I think Priyanka copied uh, the paper about the impact of COVID um, on uh, the uh, choice.
choices of users uh, in the chat box. Uh, you can refer to that uh, study. Uh, and any other question? Okay, uh, thank you everyone for joining uh, the presentations here. And um, I hope to see you in the afternoon sessions and uh, tomorrow too.